It's crazy how, and that's that's one of the things that I always try to explain to people, like why fly fishing is so special. It's like you really are reversing the food chain. Like you're taking, you know, uh, you're taking bits of animals to eat fish and <laughs> feeding them to fish. You know, like it is really the the, the best, most sadistic <laughs> of reversals uh, that we that we have in this game. <laughs> so, and it's crazy how like, how well they eat it. My name is Nick Davis, I'm the owner of 239 Flies, and you're listening to the Tom Rowland Podcast. Hey, everybody, welcome to the podcast today. Got a great one for you. My good friend Nick Davis from 239 Flies is on the podcast today. He's been on before, he's a popular guest. He's a funny guy. And we talk about all kinds of things from fly tying to snook fishing to tarpon fishing. And he's got some very interesting um, opinions and ideas on flies. I really enjoyed it and got to hear about his new shop moving locations. And it's beautiful. You got to check it out. But before we get to that shop, I want to tell you, or to that show, that part of the show, I want to tell you about a couple of things, um, all kinds of things going on. We have a um, giveaway happening with Tackle Direct, Hawks K, Lorance, Yeti, uh, Lithium Pros, um, on and on. Lots of lots of sponsors uh, associated with this. It's, uh, it's a fishing vacation to Hawks K. You get to fish with Saltwater Experience. You get to go out to dinner. You get to ha- have an awesome time in the Florida Keys with a lot of additional prizes from sponsors like Tackle Direct and Yeti and Lawrence and Lithium Pros and on and on. And it is for you to join right now. You can go to tackledirect.tv and you can sign up for that right now. You don't want to miss it. There's probably going to be more prizes added and more uh, as we go along. This is this contest is going to run for a little bit. So we want as many people to enter as possible. And that is you. I hope you win. Um, another thing that we've been doing lately that has been pretty popular and I have actually been enjoying it very much Um if you know me at all, you know that I like to read books. I like to watch motivational movies. I like to do all kinds of things uh, to help me learn from others and apply them to my own life. And that is very cool, whether that's a quote or a, uh, a book or a movie or whatever. Uh, it's just something I like to do. And I have written these Mindset Mondays over a couple hundred of them now. And what I do is I write a Mindset Monday in 400 characters or less. You get it if you subscribe to this list. You get it every Monday morning at 9.10, which is probably exactly when you need it. You want motivation to kill the week ahead of you, and that is what this will do. Uh, I'll give you a little sample, something that just went out on Monday. So if this appeals to you, you text 305-930-7346. You text the word Mindset to that number and you'll be on the list and you'll get one of these every Monday morning. 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the things you did not do than by the things that you did do. So throw off the bow lines, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, discover. That was Mark Twain. This one is self-explanatory. Do it. Live life with no regrets. Um, You know, sometimes you need to hear things like that. So I've taken a bunch of my favorite quotes, a bunch of my favorite kind of things like that, put them together for you. And uh, if you like that, you're into that kind of thing, text the number 305-930-7346, text the word mindset to that, and you'll be in. All right, here we go with Nick Davis. Hope you guys have an awesome day. Nick, what's up? Not much, man. Uh, Living the dream. A lot of shirts. uh, Thank you. My, um, these are actually, this was a semi, like a COVID project. My, uh, my 14, well, my, my then 14 year old daughter was, uh, you know, we're locked in the house for, you know, all of April, most of May. And we're also working on getting the old shop kind of like dialed in. We just got, you know, we were nearing the end of our time at the old shop, but still like always need t-shirts. And she was bugging me. She's like, I need a, a, like dad, I need like a part-time job or something. I'm like, you're 14 in the middle of a pandemic. Like what the hell do you want to like great timing, you know? So 
you know, I always try to beat it into her mind that, you know, you don't, you don't have to always take the conventional route. You can, you can kind of go it on your own and teach some entrepreneurship when I can. So she, she loves the tie dye. So, um, I bought her some shirts. Um, I got some, you know, some two, three, nine fly shirts made just some good old fashioned, like cotton guys. Yeah. And I was like, here's 78 shirts, like tie dye them go nuts. She's like, we need to make a run to Walmart. I'm like, we're not tie dyeing two, three, nine fly shirts with Walmart tie dye. That shit's not <laughs> happening. So <laughs> luckily she knew more about the tie dye game than I did. So yeah, that's what, uh, that's what we did all, uh, well, that's what she did all during the, the, uh, the shutdown. It's that's just cool, tie dye. That's cool. I, uh, um, shirts. So we still got them. It's one of our, probably our best selling items. Is that so right? Every two, three, nine flies tie dye shirt is made with, yeah, is made with, you know, semi-legal child labor, <laughs> <laughs> AKA, AKA my 14 year old daughter. Yeah. Now well, 15. That's cool. So I'm, I'm right in the process of, um, buying Bonnaroo tickets for, 2021 Bonnaroo. Uh, that's something that my daughter and I have done for the last five years. We've gone there. It surprises a lot of people that I might want to go to Bonnaroo, but Bonnaroo is, it's amazing. And it's, really I was going to say, you got to back it up. Like what is, bon what is Bonnaroo? <laughs> you don't know what Bonnaroo is? <laughs> Bonnaroo is like, I do not know the, the largest music festival on the East coast, East of the Mississippi, you know? And, uh, so you hear the, okay. about these other ones like Coachella and some of the other ones that are really huge, but Bonnaroo is a four or five day music festival. Okay. It's in Manchester, Tennessee, and they have great bands. I mean, everybody you've ever heard of, like, like, there's something for all everybody. The, there. All the staples like Corn, Tool, Jimmy Buffett. Yeah, you can have all of those people. <laughs> all the staples. I, I don't know like if Jimmy Korn, Buffett's ever. Tool, Jimmy Buffett. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if he's ever if Jimmy Buffett's ever ever played there. But you have, um, I don't know. I got to see Sturgill Simpson there. Uh, Tyler Childers there, and I also got to see in the same day I saw Post Malone. So like you can see that's a sick concert right oh. there. Dude, it's it's amazing, but the way that the whole thing is set up, it's it's really it's really set up nice. Like you can you can decide, okay, I'm a big Sturgill Simpson fan. I'm going to go get front row seats. Okay. So they okay. have this pit up front. And the pit holds like 250 people. But it's a huge area. So if you want to, you can set aside time of your day. There's a whole calendar of everything that's going on and what time and all these different stages. There's a bunch of different stages, four, five, six, seven different stages. And you decide, okay, I'm going to go and spend some time in the pit line for Sturgill Simpson. And so if you wait like an hour, two hours, probably for one like that, maybe Post Malone might be like three hours. But you're you're tired. You're you need something to eat. You're like you're going to sit down for a little bit anyway. So you pick the pit line. And you can get right into this this pit area. They'll only let 250 people in. And if you wanted to, you could like lay out a blanket right in front of the stage. Like Let's there go. would be there would yeah, be yeah. 200 people in front of you. 50 people are probably on blankets behind you. Then there's 200,000 people behind you there. There's no pushing. There's no shoving. Now what goes on behind you? I don't know what goes on back there. I never get in that. No one's got time for that. But yeah. it's like no one's I'm got either time for that. I'm either way in the back or I'm in the pit. And, but the way that they have this pit thing set up, it makes it so fun. And like we saw, my daughter and I have seen everybody she wants to see. I mean, I could, I don't know, every band that's hot right now, uh, goes there basically. So anyway, they, we had your, a, your shirt we makes had, me think about Bonnaroo and, uh, there's a lot of time. <laughs> Bonnaroo. There's a lot of things at Bonnaroo. We, I was going to say we can take the sleeves off of one for you too, if you like. Um, we do make the sleeveless model. We are sort of known for that here at Two Three Nine Flies. But nice. uh, very out, guns out. I got the template. We can do it. Yeah, you can take the traps out a little bit too. Like completely up to you. It's all customizable. Yeah, like a like like uh, kind of Randy Macho Man Savage kind of style where exactly. there's just like some strings and they're cotton. Right there. So if you got to tear it, you can. Like no big deal. You yeah. don't have the you know the resistance of polyester. Well, the funny thing is, is that in a crowd of I don't know how many people go to Bonner nobody there nobody ever fights nobody ever pushes nobody ever gets upset with one another it's the coolest nicest gentlest crowd known to mankind it's not a sporting event people aren't taking sides no no but also everyone's there to just 
Yeah, they're there to chill. But also, like, there there are longer lines at the water lines than there are at the beer lines. Because okay. generally, it's in it's it has been this whole time. It's been in the summertime. It's hotter than hell. And, you know, if you start drinking beer at 11 o'clock in the morning, you're not going to make it till 5. Not in that heat. It's just no. – and, and you see people go hard in the first couple of days – and then they just fall out and they can't make it. And then the people that are there for the whole, for the duration. That, they're in the ER while you, yeah, well, that, yeah. that line to get to the pit is down, you know, down to about 15 right. minutes. But it, it's, it's so quick. You know, you just notice right away. It's like, Ooh, I mean, I need to drink water all day to I'm sweating my ass off out here. And like, you think about drinking beer or liquor. It Doesn't would, even sound you, good. you would go downhill so fast. But anyway, your shirt reminded me of that. And that's the, the tickets just <laughs> the tickets just went on sale yesterday for 2021 because I, I don't know. It was is in 2020, they canceled it for this summer. And then they rescheduled it for September and then canceled that. And it was kind of looking like, I don't know when we're gonna have live events again. You know? Yeah. And and now yep. it's kind of coming back. My girlfriend and I had tickets to go see Kenny Chesney in May. And like, we were pumped, like we're huge Kenny Chesney fans. Um, and we got floor seats, got a hotel, got a hotel room in Tampa, like a sick hotel room, had this awesome weekend planned out. Boom. Canceled. Done. Still not doing it. Like we can still go to Tampa, right. And make the best of this. Yes, we can. But like, damn it. We're not seeing Kenny Chesney. Not this year. No. So, well, I, I can't wait for live events again. Like I think it's I coming back. <laughs> I think they are too. I think 2021 will be back to normal, at least in that, or 2022 will be back to normal in that sense. I feel like well, there's a lot of people getting vaccinated right now. And it seems like the cases are going all the way, not all the way down, but they're definitely going down. So now, we're doing a, fly tying nights again. Like, I mean, this, this is our first month of, yeah, this has been our first since our grand opening um, costume party slash Halloween party. That was, you know, it was probably about 40 to 50 deep in here. And really? like this new shop is, is huge. Yeah, it's huge. But it, like, it also kind of sucked because like 50 people could spread out in here, no problem. And it did seem, you know, semi empty at times. And there's 40 people standing around and everyone's in costume because it was our Halloween party. <laughs> so wearing a mask was no problem, but it was such a pain in the ass to like teach and talk and communicate through a mask. It was just, it, it, it totally sucked the fun out of, out of the environment. So I was like, we're just not going to do this until we can do this again. Did so, you allow like, was, uh, it, was it okay to talk through a, like a werewolf mask or, or like, Oh yeah, you could any kind of mask. We, we didn't. <laughs> I mean, I, I preface this by saying like, I was not the mask police that night. Like we had an open bar, you know, <laughs> like mm -hmm. our boys from treaty Oaks showed up and like, we turned our point of sale into a full service bar. <laughs> and, uh, and the girls came down and gave us like this awesome, like show, like one of the, um, the, the treaty Oak rep had like this giant, like punch bowl full of just this green gin drink. That was absolutely fucking phenomenal. Like I'm pretty sure there wasn't alcohol in it, but there was dry <laughs> ice in it. And there was like, it was a show, man. It was awesome. But it was just hard to, hard to talk to a, through a werewolf mask yeah. and did Hard you, to teach. And did it was you like think, the, now see, this would be my first, first thing. I'd be like, okay, we're going to have costume night and we're going to have a fly tying contest and you have to tie a fly with parts of your costume. Cause you got like craft fur, you got all kinds of shit. We'll do that from now on. Like every party <laughs> that we have, every Halloween party that we have, that is now the new caveat. Thank you for that. That's a phenomenal idea. That's why we do these things. Yeah. Brainstorming and networking. Yes, that's that's where it's at. It's also gonna um, have is you're gonna come no, up with we, some we, new names for these flies. Like this is the werewolf. This is the this is the axe where, murder victim. <laughs> this yeah, this is the oh gosh, this is the yeah, this is the Jason, uh the Jason special. Yeah. Yeah, it's but, good. We're on to something. Yeah, no, it's a great idea. We're absolutely <laughs> doing it. That's absolutely a phenomenal idea. We're doing that now. Right on. So what was it like but, to move into your new new shop? Oh my gosh. It's um it's been a good move. I mean, it was it was a real risk. Um, you know, it was we wanted to move. I know the last time we did the podcast was pretty much right down, right in that time where we were, I don't know if we were shutting down or had shut down. It was it was about a year ago. Mm -hmm. And we were kind of right on the cusp of 
you know, do we stay here indefinitely and just have a nice little business, you know, here and, you know, or do we, do we move into the end unit in our plaza, which was available? It was three times the space. It was right on the road and you know, a lot more exposure. And it's a much bigger and nicer shop that we, we could now, you know, put more than $3 into and armed with just a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of information and a little bit of like, Hey, we've done this before. Like the learning curve is not going to be nearly what it was the first time. So, you know, we, we kicked it around for a while and we were like, this is like, we got to do this. Like if we don't, I, I'm going to be on my deathbed wondering, you know, uh, and, and I don't want to do that. So, you know, James, my business partner, you know, it was been on me about this since I don't know, three months into the old shop. Like we're going to run out of space. Like there's nothing in here. We've got two t-shirts and, and four slap boards full of doll hair, you know, like <laughs> calm your ass down. Like there's nothing we need to do. Um, but yeah, we, we got in, we, we broke ground, um, July 1st and, um, it was funny. I was actually in here with, with my daughter on July 1st, like, all right, kiddo, like we're getting to work and I'm not very handy Tom. Like <laughs> I'm not, I'm not really that handy. Like I can do fine detail, like monotonous, you know, finish work. Okay. Like moldings are my specialty. Like mm. I'll do some shit out of some moldings. Okay. But knocking down something, carrying it out, like, you know, bleeding from your hands. That's not, oh, that's see, not that's where me. I live my life. That's me. I can do that part, but I can't <laughs> put it back together. I'm really good at knocking it down and, and carrying it out. That's, that's me. It's, well, see, like that's even better because I'm not even good at putting it back together. Like once <laughs> someone puts it back together, I'm good at like, you know, cleaning it and putting my name on it. That's, mm. that's what I'm good at. Yeah. So see what I did there? It was exactly. <laughs> yeah, check that out. That's, that's a Nick Davis original. Like about that. Um, but no, so, uh, you know, my brother, Jim showed up. He's been, he's been on me. He was on me about it for, for a long time too. Like I want to renovate a shop, man. I'm like, oh, like you and you and James both are just like, let's do this. Let's do this. I'm like, you guys realize that like someone does have to pay for that. Like, <laughs> like that's, that's a big jump in, uh, in rent and expenses. And Oh, by the way, we got to fill that place up. Um, but no, we, we ultimately we decided that we were going to do it. We we're going to take the risk and, and see what happens. And, um, you know, July 1st, um, my daughter and I showed up and, you know, we were in here like, okay, we can finally, um, man, like I looked at a couple of things that were glued to the wall and, <laughs> you know, it needed to be done. And I like hit it with like a hammer and I'm trying to like, and I look at Chloe and Chloe looks at me and she's just like, maybe we should wait till uncle Jim gets there. I'm like, let's do that. Let's throw some stuff away. Let's load that dumpster up. So that was, <laughs> and then he shows up with like, you know, his, his Yeti five gallon bucket full of, full of demo stuff. And he's just like, walks right in the door and just starts swinging. This place was nothing but dust and rubble in about, mm, I'll say four days. Wow. Like it was down to the tile. So I'm pretty sure his back still hurts, but, <laughs> yeah, but um, you got it going. That's good. And what, how's the reception? Been? Yeah. People happier with the, with a larger place. Oh, for sure. It, absolutely. It's been, you know, every day now still like we, we opened the front doors, uh, October 1st. Um, we got it, we got done, we got moved in. Uh, moved everything over. And our, I think our first like official day in business was October 1st, which wasn't bad. I mean, to renovate a, you know, 2,600 square foot space from, you know, this needs to be all the way redone to, okay, like we're going to move all of our stuff in here and it, it's going to be a little empty at first, but it's still more full than the last shop was when we moved in. Like, this is a really good starting point. You know, that's, that's the thing that not a lot of people see. Like when there's, when they put in a new target or a new Publix or a new big business, that thing is stocked shop and like ready right. to roll day one. Right. Like they've got capital, like, right? Like that, that they have working capital, like small business. No, 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 no. They've got like $4 left over because they had to put the floor in and like, mm, hopefully we can make a mortgage payment this month right. because you know, we got to put a new floor in a 2,600 square foot space. Uh, but nonetheless, like we did, it was, you know, it, it had been on our mind for a while at the other shop and we'd been saving and, and, you know, luckily we, we got done, you know, before the deadline that we set for ourselves and under budget. So, cool. you know, it was, 
it was pretty cool. But no, awesome. every day somebody walks in saying everybody, every day somebody walks in and says, you know, I've, I've lived here for 10 years. I've lived here for, you know, whatever I've fly fished for 30 years. I didn't even know you guys were here. Hmm. And we're like, you like, do you turn on a computer? Like all you got to do is search for anything fly fishing related. And we're like, we pop up, but nonetheless, like, and it just, it goes to show you. And it, it was a real big notice for us was that there's still a lot of value and more value than people see, even in the age of technology today. Um, the value of having a brick and mortar store that people can see mm, because yeah. people will walk through the door. Like they've got, most people have 15 or 20 minutes when they're going from A to B and, oh, that there's an open sign on that window. Like that's been abandoned for two years. That looks different. I'm going to go check it out. Mm. Oh, like shit. It's a fly shop. When did you get here? <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Like, well, we've been here for three years. We were two doors down. Yeah. But but you always there's, see like there's a lot I mean, of the that. importance of a location. Like you always see that with restaurants and stuff. Like there're just some locations that I don't know, it kind of makes sense or whatever, but it's just kind of a difficult turn to get in there. There's not enough parking or whatever and you just see one restaurant after another go out of business there and and, and out of yep. business and out of business and out of business and it's just like that little magic little piece where you have one that maybe is across the street and it's just easier to get into or maybe more traffic goes by. I don't know what happens, but that one thrives, you know, and it's just these yeah. very small little things that make a big difference. It's the, it's the kick-ass neon sign. That's what it is. That's what you got That's out what it's got to be. Yeah. I, I don't, but like, I would love to have 16 neon signs. That's always been like a little, little, little daydream of mine of just putting some like old school, like, um, you know, tattoo parlor or, yeah. you know, strip club, like neon signs on the outside, like, like instead of girls, 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 like Michael yes, Scott's St. Yes. Pauli girl. Yes. <laughs> instead of it being like fly, instead of it being like girls, 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 it'll be like flies, flies, flies. Oh, see, now you're um, onto something again. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of live nudes, it'll say live dudes. And like, they're just inside, like <laughs> they're just like inside tie, tying flies. <laughs> yeah. That, that should really bring them in. You know, you, you were onto yeah, something I, and then I think, I, I think maybe I have no have, idea why we're, no one's coming in. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, I ordered something for right. you from you and I'm going to open it right now. I, this just well, came. What we got? This just came. That kit. Yep. That, that's phenomenal. This is it. It just yeah, came. Sorry. I took so long to send that link. That's my bad. <laughs> Jimbo is in charge oh, of the hello. shop now and things get done. <laughs> Let's see. That was another big learning curve. We can get to that later in hour <clears> two. Sweet. So I ordered some flies. I'm going to be fishing here shortly. We got some Enrico Puglisi's. Those are pretty sweet. Yeah, yeah. You guys use a lot of those down your way? A lot of them. A lot of them. Yeah. Just about ex almost exclusively. Mhm. Mm really? And over over feathers. Like what do almost you think what do you think is better? Why do you like this better than than feathers? Well, there's a couple reasons why I like synthetics more than feathers, but I, I think that <sighs> how do I want to say this? Um, there are, well, first from a tying perspective, uh, synthetics are much more consistent than natural fibers. Mm -hmm. So if you get a pack of EP fibers versus a pack of, you know, marabou feathers, right. every single one of those EP fibers is going to be identical to the next one. Mm -hmm. So it is consistent. And that is, as you know, as a businessman, that is one of the most important factors of having a successful business is consistency. Like consistency is staying power. Mm -hmm. So every single pack of synthetic materials is consistent. Every pack of natural materials is inconsistent. Right. So, you know, I've noticed that the, the older generations, like they like the natural materials because that's what they grew up on. They didn't have synthetics back in, you know, in the day to play with. Like we have all of the synthetics in the world now at our, disposal like and that's you know one of the things that i kind of you know make fun of all the time is like we specialize in doll hair mm -hmm. you know like we like you have a 2600 square foot shop where you sell doll hair yes i do <laughs> <laughs> but like it's all the same so the action isn't there but the pro profile is there and you can create a better profile with a synthetic fiber than you can a natural fiber and they're much more durable so a tarpon can eat that fly and you, uh, seven times and it's still good if that were made out of marabou and 
Arctic box, it's trashed after one. Right. Now, if you're going to sit there and you're going to spend 45 minutes tying them, like, do you want it trashed after one? Well, I mean, for big tarpon fishing, sure. Like we might as well just be fishing with hundred dollar bills at the lead. We don't care. <laughs> like the bill fishermen do that. You know, like I'll pay a hundred dollars for a tarpon eat like all day. Who cares? You know, like that is, that's what you're there to do. You know, that is the sole purpose of life for the right. next two months is to hook tarpon. So, you know, but from i'll say from just from an enjoyment standpoint like you don't have to um sacrifice durability for action anymore like you can tie a a synthetic fiber fly and every single pack of feather or every single pack of fibers is going to be the same you can make a hundred identical flies with them you know if you're if if you're a good fly tire and you don't have to go hunting through packs of marabou anymore to find a good pack you know right. you don't have to look through bucktails anymore to find the ones with the longest fibers in the oh, midsection no, that That's, you can tie your deceivers out of i mean i had a guy tie my flies that was in montana his name was craig jansen he was really one of the best fly tires i've ever i've ever um had the opportunity to buy his flies or, or fish around but one of the reasons i mean the, the, he was a pretty decent fly tire but the best thing about him was that he had a really tight relationship with dan bailey's fly shop and they would order all of their saddle hackles and their tarpon hackles and all their materials and he would be the first one to sort through all that stuff and he would be like yeah, yeah this one and this one yep. and this one and this one and i'm buying 50 mm-hmm. of these and everybody mm-hmm. else gets the leftovers, you know, and, yep. you know, if you can make that pick, that's a, that makes your flies so much better. And his flies never fouled. And, but, but you could have someone with exactly the t- same fly tying skills and, and inferior materials, and you might get a foul. You might get flies, flies look like shit, right? <laughs> you know, know. it's, it's time on and it's like, I don't want to throw that. Right. It, it, it is, you know? Um, you know, and then I don't have confidence to fly anymore. Right. The materials are, are the best. Now, when we look at some of these flies, um, so we're, you're talking about all of the um, uh, benefits of the synthetics. And then here I've got an Enrico Puglisi one right here that is synthetic and, mm-hmm. and natural. So you got rabbit, rabbit on the back and, and uh, kind of a toad type front body with, wow. With like some, um, I'm going to pull this one out and look at it because it's got a good like one. some rubber legs in there. Yes. And when when you're first learning how to tie flies, let's talk about this. This seems like this seems like a complete impossibility, but I do know the trick now um, of how to leave the rubber legs in there and trim everything else off, um, and then have the rubber legs stick out. Um, Just pull that whole thing out. There you go. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah, there's the rabbit some, strips. There's some serious packaging that goes on into this, these flies here. Uh, right. One of the many reasons I love those flies. Yeah. How is Enrico doing? I used to see him all the time. He's doing good. Um, we actually had a fly tying night with Enrico last year before all the madness hit. Um, it was awesome. He came down and um, he wanted to fish, but wanted to do it. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Um, wanted to do a fly tying night or wanted to do a, a video and go fishing and all that. I'm like, well, it's Enrico. Like I got a videographer, you know, on staff, my boy, Patrick Ray, you know, let's shoot a little how to video in the shop and, uh, you know, do a kick-ass fly tying night. And that's exactly what we did. And like, he came down and put on a show for us. Nice. The trick is that you got to get like Enrico asked for a water because, you know, he's talking and, you know, it's hard to talk with, without a drink sometimes, you know, voice gets a little parched, but I was like, Rico, this is a, this is a fly shop, buddy. You know, they flush toilets with that stuff. Like <laughs> we don't have water here. He's like, what do you have? I'm like, uh, all the Modelo you can drink. <laughs> so you got to get, you got to get two Modelos in EP before he, you know, loosens that, up and starts that, having a good time. That right. <laughs> that's the magic. That's the magic that's trick. The magic but trick. yeah, let's talk about that fly. Yeah. What do you call um, this one? Rabbit's awesome. Yeah, I'm a big that fan is, of rabbit. Uh, what is that? This one. Rabbit's a really good... See, rabbit's one of the few few natural materials that I think will always have um, always have a place in, in saltwater fly tying. Mm-hmm. Um, that, rabbit is, is more consistent than most natural fibers. Um, most every 
package of, of rabbit hair is going to be similar to the one that it's tied with yeah. next to it. So rabbit is rabbit is consistent. Um, and it's also durable. It gets a little heavy when you're throwing it, but that's what makes it a great tarpon fly. Yeah, it but you're, a little bit. you're using, you know, you're using a, an 11 weight. It shouldn't be too yeah. bad. And you might, even, using trim a that, telephone you might pole. even trim that down a little bit. Like, you know, you could just make some earrings out of, of the rest of it. Yeah. Hey, when you're using, um, when you're using rabbit to Palmer, do you use cross cut mm-hmm. rabbit or are you cutting the, the hair off of the strip and then using that in like a dubbing loop or something? How do you do it? So both, both work. Um, it depends on what you're trying to do with your application. Like if you're trying to make a really bushy collar, that's going to push a lot of water. Mm-hmm. Um, and also tying it on a little bit lighter of a fly or a little bit lighter of a hook, I'll cut it off and use it as a dubbing brush. Mm. Um, but if you're looking for a little bit thinner of a profile, I'll use the cross cut stuff. Mm. Um, you know, for, uh, one of, one of my favorite flies that we've got in the shop is the Chacones. Um, uh, what's that damn thing called? Um, the Tuscan bunny. Okay. And he uses yeah, that. He uses, yeah, he uses that. Um, in a, in a, in a, in a dubbing brush or in a dub, he dubs that and twists it into a, into a, you know, in a dubbing loop and then polymers it. And it makes a very bushy, you know, uh, where the fibers are sticking out perpendicular mm-hmm. to the hook shank. Mm-hmm. And it pushes a lot of water that way. It gets a much wider profile, but like in the butts, big money minnow shout out to my boy, Brian butts. Uh, when he ties that thing in, he uses, um, he uses a cross cut and the taper on it is a lot more thin. So it's more of a redfish fly than it is a tarpon fly, but you still get the action of, of the rabbit on there. Cause rabbit, I mean, you get that stuff in the water and, and it pulsates and it breathes and it, it does its own thing. So, right. so that fly doesn't have to move, you know, in the water forward or backwards for it to be moving. Yeah. That's so important, man. I, I think that that is, I think that's one of the reasons why I kind of a little bit prefer feathers over, over synthetics. Like if I had, if I had to choose, I would kind of choose feathers a little bit more for some applications, not always, but um, I have seen the offshore, like the the tuna and stuff like that, tend to bite mm-hmm. the feathers better than they fight than they bite the the synthetic flies. I don't know why. I think it just shows up a little better for some reason. I don't know. Maybe they can see see through it, you know, with the with the light just goes right Maybe. through it, and they just like. I don't know. I've had trouble getting those to bite. And then you just take an old lefties deceiver bucktail with, with feathers. And it's like, it's on. Throw it out there and done. Yeah. But it's it's, crazy. It's It's just, go ahead. I was going to say like, it's crazy how, and this, that's one of the things that I always try to explain to people like why fly fishing is so special. It's like, you really are reversing the food chain. Like you're taking, you know, you're taking bits of animals to eat fish and (laughs) feeding them to fish. You know, like it is really the, the, the best, most sadistic um, reversals, uh, that we, that we have in this game. So, and it's crazy how, like, how well they eat it too. Like, like, you know, damn well, there's hardly any fish that are out there eating birds. Like that's not on their, that's not on their, that's not I don't on their know, plate. Man. You ever you see know? that video of the Trevally eating those birds? That, that was an incredible video. That was video. pretty sick. Um, that was pretty they, sick. They eat them, man. And then the, then the sharks are eating them too. On that same, that tiger beach in the Bahamas, they have all that footage of them eating the cormorants and the baby cormorants. They just chow down on those things. Um, but you're, you're right. Um, they probably don't eat, eat them regularly. I don't know that a tarpon eats a bird. Maybe you would. Tarpon would probably eat a bird if it fell in. I think a tarpon would be too lazy to eat like a, a bird. Robin? Like those things are the those are just the laziest eating fish on the in the sea. Like I don't know, but if it was it, just flopping on the surface there, it couldn't get up. Its wings are wet, and it was yeah right, sitting out kind of in the middle of a laid up area. You don't think like that's what a crab does, and it just kind of makes little waves, and then all of a sudden kapoom, it, it would, that would happen. Kapoom, that would happen. Kapoom, right. That would definitely over. happen. <laughs> I always like some, I always like some fish baby like duck that. flies. Yeah, well, I mean, when I was a kid, I used to just just read Field and Stream magazine and dream. You know, there would always be the article in there about the largemouth bass that that ate a bird, or or like you know a muskie that ate a duck. And I was just like, man, that's got to be the most incredible thing. I want to go. Nature is so metal. Never did I never did I think that when I was a kid that I'd be fishing for things that would eat. You know. Lots bigger things than that, but um, 
Yeah, that nature was, is so cool like that. I know it really is, and when you see it happen, it's just incredible. So we got we got all these. You got me covered here. Let me let me talk mm-hmm. about this one. This is this little umqua um, megalopsicle. One. Yeah, a megalopsicle. Well, it has a really yep, good name. That's what they're calling that one. Okay, I like it. The does name. whose fly is this? I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. I I tie something similar. Um, but I you didn't come up with a name. Pop. Oh no! Come on, dude. Nah. Who who had the who had it first? I'm going to maintain. Um, I'm going to maintain that I, I I came up with mine before I even noticed those. But I don't know. I don't know. Huh. I don't know. I don't know. How so one's called before. a mega lopsicle, and one's called a mega lollipop. Yeah, I did mine about. I don't know. Six Something years tells ago. me some one one of those saw the other. <laughs> And was like, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, I've seen a few redfish riddlins floating around in catalogs, but. <laughs> All right. So when you tie a fly like this or, or whatever, tell me what, what you're using this for. Cause it's got a weed guard. It's got a little deer hair collar. It's got a palmered uh, or whatever you call it head um, with the deer hair. It's like, got a, like so a, that's got like an Arctic Fox collar and it's got a, a, a deer body hair uh, head. So deer body hair uh, or deer belly hair. Uh, float. They're very yeah. buoyant. Uh, when those fibers get tied onto a hook shank, they splay out and you trim them with a razor blade and it almost makes, um, almost makes like a little cork mm-hmm. on the, on the hook shank. Um, if you don't weight it, it will float. And, uh, pu- again, pushes a lot of water. Deer hair, deer hair is magical. Like all forms of deer hair is magical. Uh, when tied on a hook shank, it's really the closest thing to, to unicorn hair that we have in the game. <laughs> um, you know, everyone's always trying to get unicorn hair. Um, and uh, the, about the closest thing we have to it is deer hair. Yeah. But that's a kick-ass little, that's what, a kick-ass What is this? Fly. This is not Enrico fibers on the end, like these other flies. What is this called? It's not, you can tie, I tie mine with bucktail. Um, but you can tie it with crapper. You can tie it with pseudo this, hair. You can crapper? tie them with. That is crapper. Yes. Yep. Okay. That one's crapper on there. Um, and then, and then, like I said, an Arctic, co- <clears throat> an Arctic box collar and, um, the deer belly hair head, a little bit of bee chain to get it down. Mm-hmm. I like this because, um, we, we have some situations where we'll get up early and you can, um, throw to the tarpon on a real calm day you can get big ones to eat something right off the surface and we for a long time we mm-hmm. threw what we called a frog and the frog was just basically a mouse really i mean it was just a big mm-hmm. spun deer hair and then it had some hackles coming off the back but what would happen to that is that sometimes occasionally it would they would blow it out of the water because it was so light weight and it, but you needed it to to we would even put that zinc on it remember that stuff that that you mm-hmm. it was like yeah. sinking it was supposed to sink your leader but we would put it on the deer hair and then you could get it to float down in the film but then what i started doing is is tying a gurgler with rabbit body like a crosscut rabbit body and so then that rabbit hair would like hold it in the water just enough to where the tarpon wouldn't blow it out of the water and they could get their whole mouth around it and that seemed to make a big difference in hooking you can also take a little bit of like lead wire or lead free wire, which I also wonder what they make that out of <laughs> um, and then tie it <laughs> and tie it around your leader. I normally put it around the hook shank, um, like right around the eye of the hook, Yeah. but you can take it and you can actually put it up near the bite tip it and then zap it in with a little bit of uh, like U- loon UV. You can just have it on the boat and then, you know, like hide in the sun, put the loon UV on there put a little piece of that on there so that the whole thing will just sink a little Hmm. bit you know just that little bit of weight on the bite tip it will bring that fly down just just a little bit yeah um i've never had great luck with with tarpon on top water unless they're under 30 pounds yeah over 30 pounds i I have not had good luck Uh, it's 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 Um, it's definitely a a situation that you're looking for and otherwise i don't even attempt it but um yeah if the situation's right which is first light real calm bunch of weeds around they're slowly rolling mm-hmm. now you can you can get them to bite like they, they just do one of those big slow nope. rolls and sit there you know they haven't moved right like and then they blow mm-hmm. bubbles and you're like oh that fish is exactly right there pull up to it real quiet and then put that out in front of it and just pull 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 and 
yeah. you know, you don't even really see it coming. There's not even, and it's so calm and the tarpon moves so slowly that there's not even a wake. Maybe you might see a flick of a tail and then it's like, Oh, mm-hmm. it's coming. Like, Oh shit. Blam. Here we go. It's yeah. on, but it is one of the best bites in all You're of fishing. It really is when you're starting happens. to tingle. You're starting to tingle a little bit. I can yeah. tell because no, you're doing I mean, this like what next week? Like you're getting yeah, hit it. Yeah, no. It, I mean, it's a. It's it's a. It, it has to be right. Everything has to be right. Sometimes you have those flies mm-hmm. in your box and and you don't use them. Um, you know, you, you tie a whole bunch of them, hoping that you're going to get in that situation a bunch of different times, and then you just don't ever use them. Um, yeah. So this is this is you gotta have a top that I'm super excited about. These worms. Yeah. The old chili pepper worm. Yeah. So is that, um, what do you call that? Talk about that right there. The fur, is that a furled tail? Is that what that's called? That is a a feral tail. I'm not sure. Um, Furled is where you like take a, take a. You would, yeah, you would know better than I do. Well, in trout fishing, you would have, you have like a grasshopper body. You can have a furled body. So you take like yarn or any sort of long thing and you just start spinning it and start spinning it. And like a bimini twist Mm -hmm. in the middle, it'll just twist up. And then you'll have Mm -hmm. two strands that are coming like this. And then you just pinch it and tie it on the hook like that. And that's the, that's what they call a furled body. And it stays like that. Yeah. It's pretty good technique. That's what it looks like. This is because there's not an. That end sounds to like it. a lot easier than I would do it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's not an end to this, right? Like, like no. on the very end of this, it just rolls back down like a bimini twist almost. Um, yeah, that that that's a much smarter way of doing it. I I would have taken a piece of like eighty pound mono, tied it in, and then wrapped that thing. Oh, but which then, would have been but your way would never foul. My way would never foul. Correct. But it but also would I don't, be I don't stiff know as a board. And it would also take 45 minutes to tie that little bitty fly. <laughs> yeah. In true, in true two, three, nine flies fashion, let's take nice. something incredibly simple and make it incredibly complex. Yeah. Well, I like that. A lot of people, I mean, people have been fishing with the worm fly in the middle of the day when, when there's no worm hatch for a long time since, since yes. they first saw the Palolo worm and saw what, saw what tarpon do with it. But I always like to have the different worm flies and I hadn't seen this one. Um, I tie a yeah, bunch of different that's a cool ones. One. Some of them are super simple. Some of them are, are a little more complicated, but this one, this one looks good to me. I like it. What's this material called? I've seen know? some of the, I think, I don't know exactly what that is. I've played around with them a little bit. We just got these uncle flies in and, um, I want to say that that is the, the hairline, um, uh, what do they call it? The, the wire free Fox brush. That's what it seems like. It's very close to. Okay. Um, and I, I want to say that's what it is. So are you having um, success with these flies in your area? Are a lot of people I haven't having? A lot of, I haven't fished a lot of those in, in my area yet. I'm mainly in my area. Like if I go out with EJ, like we're throwing black and purple EP minnows, mm-hmm. two O's, that's it. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was just wondering because like, do you even have Palolo worm hatches up that way? We don't. Uh, we we don't have hatches. Now, I wonder where the I, I wonder know, where the 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 uh, boundary is for the, that. The farthest north that that'll go. Yeah, probably like Miami. I want. I bet you. I I do know that the the guys here throw them for. Or there are guys in the shop, both working and fishing here, that throw palo worms at tarpon. As long as it's in the spring, they'll throw it, even hmm. if there's no hatch around. Like even up here, wow. and I've had success. Yeah. Well, it's like, I guess when you're, um, you know, like the striped like what bass fish, fish doesn't eat a worm. Right. I mean, well, one that doesn't know what it is, I guess. But, um, if you're striped bass fishing, um, a lot of times, you know, the striped bass will move into another area where eels aren't, aren't really the source anymore, but you throw some sort of eel looking thing or cobia cobias eat a mm-hmm. ton of eels up North and then they come down to the keys. And I guess we have some eels, but it's not like. I mean, I've never seen a bait shop main sell food stable. like they do up there, yeah. you know? I mean, like they sell these things of eels, which if you want to make sure that your girlfriend never wants to go fishing with you again, go <laughs> go fish with eels like and, and buy them yeah. at the store. That would be, she's like, oh, I'm out. That's that's disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine walking into a store and buying a handful of eels. Like, give me a bushel of eels. Yeah. Put that on my tab. They do, man. They they sell them up in there, and I guess they're easy to catch too. They trap them, or I don't know what they how they catch the bait eels. Those but. are the shrieking eels. <laughs> but you know, but the cobia. If you throw like a big old uh, 
what are those things called? The the giant hoagies. Um, yeah. They look like an eel and they eat the crap out of them, you know, even in a place where there aren't any eels. The, and <clears throat> awesome snook bait too. I remember fishing with, uh, you said hoagies. Like, mm -hmm. um, I remember fishing with my buddy Ben one day. We were, you know, pouring down rain in the middle of summer and we were fishing this uh, golf course pond that we were not supposed to be yet. And, you know, I'm walking around wait, just like, oh, yeah, look at me. At this, you know, he's got a spinning rod, like a 4,000 reel on there, and he's throwing these hoagies. Okay. And I'm like, Nothing's going to eat that. The thing's a foot and a half long. Like you're fishing a golf course bond. He's like, watch this. And he winds up and he chucks this thing like clear over the lake. Okay. I mean, it, the lake is probably 40 yards long mm -hmm. and he's like surf cast this thing like in the air, like he hit a golf ball, like just on the other side of the lake. And I'm like, okay, you missed the water. You know, <laughs> like maybe, maybe try to get in the water next time. He's like, watch this and just eases it into the water. And as soon as it hits the bank on the other side, Mm -hmm. yes. I just blowed up. I mean, 40 inch snook on the golf course pond on a foot and a half hoagie. I can believe like, it. I can believe it. And you I think can also believe you that, think they're eating snakes over there. Yeah. They'll eat snakes and lizards and probably whatever goes in the water. But, um, it's interesting that he, he, did yeah. it like that because I used to fish golf course ponds all the time and I'd do it with a fly rod and I would stand 60 feet back from the pond. 50 feet, 40 feet back from the pond, like nowhere even close and throw a cast and the whole fly line lands on the grass and the leader rolls into the, into the pond. And then you just kind of work it back to the bank. Like it was just a frog that just kind of fell in right there. And there's certain times of the year where those bass would be right on the edge. Like my dad would, he played golf a lot and he's like, I hit another ball in the lake. And when I walked over there, there were three bass sitting right there in about an inch of water. And it's like, Okay, perfect time to go over there and try to try to catch that. And that's what I would do when I was a kid. I didn't have much to do with a golf course other than the uh, than than catching the fish on there. Other than get, the fish in the pond and getting run off uh, on the wrong <laughs> golf course. But uh, yeah, man, they they do get right up on that edge. That's a good way that that your buddy fished it. Yeah, um, snook do it too. Like right on the beach. I mean, you'll see. Uh, oh yeah, you'll see the snook on the beach in here. Just I mean, like practically on this on the same. And, you know, putting sunscreen on their nose. I mean, they're damn near out of the water. Yeah. And you'll just be walking along in the middle of summer, you know, look down, there's a 30 inch snook just sitting on a chase lounge, sun in his ass. Just there he is. It's Cause that's like, where the food you is. You want to swim in some water, buddy? Like, I yeah. know, but he's, he's making that's a living the right there. French fry bits from, uh, from the gumbo yeah. limbo. <laughs> from everyone that's walking out, you know, throwing their stuff in, uh, throwing their, throwing their stuff in the water right there. They'll eat that too. I'm so, sure. Those are some good eating fish. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But no, so it's crazy how fish will hang out in no water. So but. do you have, um, like you sent me this little selection of flies. I asked for some of them. I didn't ask for others. I'm assuming that some of these are, are what you're forecasting to be the hot fly for the, for the year. But do you have, do you see a trend, um, in tarpon flies that, that is, that it's moving to or what? I mean, I, I think that the, I think the market and the fish are, I don't know if the fishery, but I definitely think that more guys want to throw synthetics now over naturals. Um, I, and I think for that very reason, like if time is scarce, if you got to sit down and tie them, you want to tie something that's going to last you for a while, you know, like saltwater fly fishing is very different than freshwater fly fishing and that you can tie a fly on first thing in the morning and you might not take it off the rest of the day. You might just leave that thing on there. It's, you know what I mean? It like, like turkey hunting where you have, you buy one box of shells and you have the same three shells in your gun the whole season. And then you finally kill the turkey yeah, at the end. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, more days than not, we have set out and especially on the, in, in the baby tarpon um, side of things, uh, black and purple minnow tied on and get to the spot. Okay. Like got an eat on the first couple of casts and, fish that all day and it almost becomes a game how long can you how many fish can you catch on this one fly before it's completely toast <laughs> so I, I think that i think that largely like the trend in in flies is moving to synthetics and i think that's just because they're more no. consistent it doesn't own them you know all the same dozen they all look the same they all look identical and they all fish identically yeah. um so <laughs> depending on how you want to look at it. Cause I mean, I guess eh, 
there's arguments to be made from both sides on the form of, you know, which one's more eco-friendly, um, you know, but uh, I think largely, largely like flies are moving more synthetic over natural. What about hooks? Just materials are easier to source too. What do you see for, for, for hooks as far as where people are moving to when you, you have people that are requesting tide, you know, tide flies or, or you just hear in your shop, like a certain hook is, do you have any new hooks? <laughs> I think I, we do have new hooks. Uh, there's some really exciting new hooks out there, like the new series from Umqua. Um, Umqua just rolled out a bunch of, of new hooks that are really, really fire. I mean, jig hooks. Um, uh, what are the? What's not? They're now. Now it's leaving me. The um, not the triple threat. The um, the bendbacks. Gosh, I don't know why that word was escaping me. Um, <laughs> Bendax. Um, has got a brand new hook. That's a, that's a bendax hook. Um, so you don't have to like sit there and bend the hook anymore to like make it, you know, it's super sticky, completely redesigned and, and works really well. Um, I think that fly tires are always going to walk into a fly shop and ask for gamagatsus, mm -hmm. you know, for salt water, mm -hmm. um, regardless of, regardless of what we do or how much we market another, a hook type or tie flies on something else. Like you got any Gamagasu SC 15s? Like what size are you looking for? One or two Oh, both. Okay. Um, that, you know, like it just one of those things, you yeah, know, that hook is, that hook is really good. That's my favorite hook. It's, it's really I, like, it's everyone's favorite. I mean, it, hook. It you, works, know? And it, you know, it works. And, and, but what was the big thing about that particular hook is that, you know, before when that hook first came out, the alternative was like a, 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 a must add 3407 and mm -hmm. we would sharpen that with a file or a Dremel tool at home. And of course, when you do that now, it's going to rust way faster and way easier. Yep. And then, then all of a sudden, you know, this, this SC 15 comes out, it's thinner, it's stronger. It is way sharper. And it mm -hmm. worked and, and we're using yeah. this little tiny hook. The first time I ever saw it, Fitz Coker brought it on the boat and I, and I was just like, what, you think you're going to catch a tarpon with that? And he's like, we're going to see. And we never yeah. had one straighten out. We never had, I mean, it was sticky as it could be. It, it did the mm -hmm. job. And I was like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sold. That's fine. Sold. Yeah. And then sold. at the same time you had some other ones. I remember there was a batch of TM Co's that were breaking. They would break right behind the barb yeah. and just one after another, after another. And then you'd have four or five that would do well. And then, then they just started breaking and breaking, breaking. And I was like, I'm never using that again. Like this, I'm done. Yeah. done with that's that a, that's maybe the they, thing. Maybe like, they fixed is, it. And that's, and, and they have, I mean, there's, you hear those stories of, you know, I had, I had this hook bend on me. I had this hook break on me. I had this, and you know, we as fly fishermen get very, very picky about, or I don't want to say picky, but protective of, of our, of our little homes, of, mm -hmm. of, of what we, what we know and love. If you get a hook that breaks on you, like you immediately hate everything about that company. Oh, You're like, I'm, I'm done with you. you. Like it is the worst breakup ever. Yeah. And you, you got one bad hook out of, you know, the 50,000 they made that day, Yeah, but you know, and that's, over and over that's what again. you got. And all of a sudden, ex but, and when it happens but, over and over again, like, you know, okay, that, like hook, that, that particular hook was, was very popular among like production fly tying and Pete, your customers would bring them down and you'd look at it and you go, that's a beautiful fly. I don't know if we should trust that hook yeah. or not. And they're like, Oh, yep. well, I got a whole box of them. I spent $500 on these things. You're like, okay. And you tie it on and they get one bite a day and the hook breaks. You're like, mm. yep. Problem. That's like, that's like the, the famous little, little meme, I guess is the guide opens the box and says, those are beautiful flies. Boom. Let's use mine. <laughs> yep. Yep. Because they know we got a cigarette butt tied on an SL 12 S short. Like you're throwing this. <laughs> yeah. But they, they have confidence in it. You know, it's going to be a lot of work and, and you get all that work done and either the fly fouls or the hook breaks or something like that. And the whole, that's your whole day right there. Sometimes I that fish, can be it. I fish, I fish Tiemco 600 SPs for a very long time. And that's the most, it's the most expensive book on the market, but it's incredibly sharp, incredibly strong, you know, but I had heard somebody told me that they had one bend on them. And I'm like, there's no way like the 600 SP, like that thing's made the price tag that's on it. You just assume that it was made with like pistachios and printer ink. <laughs>
because those are the two most expensive things on planet earth. They must've put two of them together to make this hook, you know, like each hook, like for a one, like they're, they're over a dollar a piece wow. and they're incredibly sharp and you know, they're really, really nice. And I fished them for years and never had a problem. And whenever somebody would tell me like, Oh, I had one of those bend on me one time, you know, I, I still fish them, but one time I had one bend on me. And I was like, well, you know, there's, you're always going to find a bad batch of something like something you go to the same restaurant enough times. Eventually you're going to get sick just because the odds are against you, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, and eventually I had one bend on me and I mean, I've fished this thing for six years and I've never had a single one break bend, nothing. I hooked about a 30, 35 pounder on a seven weight. And it was going for the trees and it was like our third or fourth fish of the day. So we were kind of, we were like, we were in fuck off mode. It was just like, okay, like you're not, you're not going to get in the trees. Like I'm going to, we're going to get you over here. I'm going to take a picture of you. And like, just force this thing around, hook fly pop, or the hook popped out. And I go to like cast it again. I look at it and it was bent. Mm -hmm. I'm like, there's no way. Like this hook doesn't bend. There's so I, I called up one of the, uh, the, one of our customers who told me like, Oh yeah, no, I've, I'm back to it. But no, I bent one of those. So I'm, I'm done with it. Mm. And I told him, I was like, it finally happened. I bent one. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, as all, as all that goes, I mean, you can, you can definitely get some good advice from people and there are probably definitely some hooks you should stay away from, but you know, for the most part, it's whatever works for you and what works for some people doesn't work for others. And I don't know, it's kind of personal, yeah. kind of personal too, It is. but there are and some tried and true ones like the SC 15. That one's pretty well tested. Yep. That one's pretty well damn good. That one always works. Yeah. Well, listen, so, man, I'm proud of you for starting the new shop. It was cool uh, to talk about these flies, and uh, I'm ready to get out there and use them um, right now. It's going to be good. Yeah. Hell yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, first thing I'm throwing is this worm. When, do, when did it. your trip? Um, well, we I'll be fishing all through the, the spring here, but um, in about a – week and a half i'm going to be uh doing a lot of tarpon fishing so hell yeah should be good should be good well, if, if you find yourself in the bonita beach area you know where we're at okay i'll come by i gotta check come out the by. new shop all right yeah. let everybody yeah, know how to we'll find do, you uh, uh well we're online at two three nine flies.com um we the website uh it's got the address on it we're at the corner of bonita beach road and us 41 right here in beautiful bonita beach florida um yeah there's if you want to get us it's not too hard we're on instagram and uh facebook and um uh, youtube at 239 flies and you can always pick up the phone and uh give us a shout all right jimbo's standing by very cool very cool all right so, man well thanks i appreciate it and uh oh look i got you sent me a whole sticker pack he'll send you a sticker, sticker pack, pack too look at that those are cool stickers man i like them Throw them on the sign, like at any like sign down in the keys, just like, you know, like right on there. Yeah. At the <laughs> marina. Right with the Don't boat. Don't do that. I'm right pretty sure that's the, illegal. With the boat stickers. Well, I didn't do it. You did. Mm -hmm. It's uh, your name on it. I'm going to blame it on <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> He's young. He can rebuild it. Yeah. There you go. All right, Nick, man. Great talking with you again. And um, and good luck this, this spring. If you find some more hot flies, send them my way. Same to you, Tom. Thanks for having me on.